Welcome to RoboHub. So today I have with me Brady Watkins from SoftBank Robotics. How are you doing, Brady? Pretty good, Abate. How are you? Happy Friday. Thank you. Thank you. Doing great. Could you give yourself a little bit of background? Sure. Uh, so my name is Brady Watkins. I'm the general manager of SoftBank Robotics America. Um, we, we're in a really fun space in that we are a part of the overall SoftBank ecosystem. So we are one of the few companies, if you're familiar with SoftBank, um, that carry the SoftBank name. And our charge and mission is to be able to bring uh, value to humanity through commercializing robotic solutions. My job is to run uh, a very important part of the business, which is the North American market, specifically figuring out how to scale and commercialize uh, robotics in the United States. Yeah, what brought you into robotics? That's a really good question. Uh, so two parts, we're gonna go way back, uh, even as a child, and I didn't realize this till I got into robotics, things like transformers or fun toys to play with, this idea of how to generate experiences with cool, robots actually at the time with transformers has been something that i've always been drawn to sort of as playing in my youth um my family actually my dad's side of the family a lot of engineers um that said i grew up more of in a business setting so my career goals have really been focused on commercial um so when i graduated um business school uh from an undergrad i wanted to go in to really understand how i could help bring really cool experiences in a technology format. So I actually got into video games really early and it was an interesting juxtaposition of storytelling and technology. Um, you see a lot of things of how to create really cool experiences utilizing um, both software development, engine platform, and then thinking about how to really sell and commercialize that. You really have this hardware software experience connection point. And I found that it was a really fun industry, still is an amazing industry, and I think it continues to grow. So um, about five, six years ago, I had a really great opportunity to come into robotics, and I thought it presented a really cool challenge um, as I really saw robotics as it's been in, in, in industry for over 100 years, but there was this point that I felt like is now happening, and I think that's why we're here talking about it, where this intersection of uh, experience, hardware, software, technology is going to be at a convergence. And I really wanted to be at the forefront of helping to drive adoption um, in a commercial setting, really provide those experiences. And so jumped over this great opportunity at SoftBank Robotics um, and have been there since. Um, and I think only affirmed, you know, not only how fun the industry is, but how it's still sort of in its um, early stages of growth um, and adoption, both from a technology perspective, as well as just from a commercial perspective, which makes it really fun. Yeah. Now you bring up a great point about um, us being at this intersection because robotics is a, it's a field that relies on a lot of different parts coming together at the same time. You know, your perception stack, your um, ability to understand the environment, your actuation, and I actually just very recently came back from uh, ICRA um, 2022 yep. and just seeing the progress of luggage robotics um, and then how every year they're just making massive strides forward, going from being able to like walk just a little bit and like fall over and they're like kind of clumsy and goofy um, to now like actually autonomously searching through caves and like accomplishing missions that you would, you know, would be difficult for a person to do. Absolutely. Um, and SoftBank Robotics has been a part of uh, a part of like legged robotics and research and like a lot of this stuff um, since the early days. Absolutely. Well, and I think we use, we like to think about it like there's four key components of robotics to be solved. It's, we sort of say hands, feet, face. So like face a lot, if you see, is that interaction of how do you create that human to robot or humanoid connection? That was with Pepper. Feet from a mobility perspective of how do we actually really understand um, mobility and sort of critical thinking. So how can the technology move in and around both people and or environments to be successful? And then hands solving a really awesome robotic problem is how do we actually deliver dexterity um, of what we know as sort of our disposable, our opposable thumbs, but really trying to solve that and bring that into an automation. So those sort of kind of is, that's a, like the overarching like robotic problems to solve. And we like to be a part of each of them both today and and in the future, but 
One extra point for me that I always think is interesting about where this intersection is, is I also think unit cost economics are actually at an intersection is now you can actually get there. The parts needed to be able to scale some of these solutions are now becoming readily available in a cost down, you know, whereas LIDAR is a great example, it used to be 10x its cost only five years ago is now starting to be absorbed where you can actually see these products not only have a value proposition that's starting to be um, scalable, but now you can actually even see the supply and demand. So I see both technology stack increasing in its advanced capabilities, but also the supply chain and unit economics of even the parts necessary um, to create some really good solutions. And I think that's why we're at a really fun point in the industry to be able to see some hyper growth, you know, in the next five to 10 years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Actually, a couple more examples I can think of would be like computation, obviously, um, purpose built AI chips um, and sensors like stereo depth sensors that run everything on the edge so that the robotics engineer company doesn't have to redesign those things from the ground up anymore every time they make something. Yep. And that's the hardest part, actually, of when you get into service robotics is I think we've actually moved at a place where the technology is available. It's now how do we actually get adoption into a market dynamic that makes this more successful? So we have now the ability to accumulate the technology to create a solution. How do we make sure that solution is able to be adopted in and amongst a current marketplace that's big enough so that we've got the unit economics so that we continue to funnel not only investment, but development, but also create value uh, in a marketplace through experience. If you look at SaaS uh, five years ago, or when it was sort of from zero to, to year five, um, it was still um, in its infancy, you were still having to create a lot of your algorithms and libraries, and you're still having to do a lot of the work independently. And so it was not necessarily a widely adopted, but about year five, I think it about hit about 10 to 12 billion um in revenue and then that was the tipping point of then all of a sudden it sort of crossed the chasm of adoption capability you had the the you know some similar architectures that were coming across so now you could see us an advancement of the large players but also an industry that was continuing to pop up and it scaled and i think we're kind of at that point now where you're seeing it um you know really be big enough so that it actually is now here to stay and scale but now you have sort of the core components to really take off which is really what we focus on that the commercial orchestration of all of those components is a lot of what our mission is. And from SoftBank to sort of think bigger is to try to help perpetuate that and doing it by building products ourselves, but also doing it by enabling other companies to be able to understand and commercialize um, in markets that are big enough so that we can really create some meaningful value in the marketplace. So I love where we are and I like to sort of share it's, you know, if, if you're looking to get into the industry, if you had known what you knew about SaaS, in year five of its development, um, wouldn't you have leaned in? And I think the answer is yes. And I think we're right about at that point in terms of where ser service robotics, smart robotic capabilities and verticals and industries are. So I really see us, this is a fun, you know, we, we do inter we interviews and I talk to a lot of people. This is a fun time to be in this market. It's not niche, it's immensely scalable. And I think we're at the right point to make that happen. Yeah, yeah. So could you give us like a, a high level overview of what SoftBank Robotics, what they're doing and what their current values are and goals? Sure. And I think the well, the best way to do that is we use some examples of sort of our flagship product that helps, I think, share our vision. So SoftBank Robotics, our goal is actually our number one goal is to create value for humanity. So it's a very lofty and ambitious goal, but that's important is how do we leverage robotics and artificial intelligence capabilities and technology to create value for humanity and for humans. And you do that through understanding how smart robotics can make decisions to automate single tasks and really to create a proof of performance and value equation that allows both the workforce um, to be able to up-level itself and evolve from a transformation perspective. And then also just from a client and user experience, being able to have now more clarity and confirmation of the performance. So we're able to take tasks that maybe um, uh, people didn't want to do or don't want to do or couldn't do as efficiently and allowing them to up-level and do uh, those services. So really focused on the collaborative aspect. That's our mission. Um, what we do is our the product today that best personifies that is Wiz, which is an indoor uh, mobile autonomous vacuum cleaner with, within cleaning services. 
And I think how we think about what we are is we're a commercial group. Um, and really what we look for is where there's scalable industries, where there is a major gap in task to service value. Um, and if you look, the cleaning industry is one of the largest um, service industries in the world. It's dominated a lot by uh, a workforce that's delivering a lot of that value. And the inherent challenge in that workforce of around, you know, it's 50 billion in value globally is everyone, both the, the employer and the actual tenant or client, um, they all are expecting the workforce to uplevel from a skill set perspective. So we, there's a stat that was uh, put out, BCG, it's around 94% of all employers expect their workforce to level up. Um, those employers want those employees want to level up their skill sets, but only less than 50% are actually taking advantage of it. Or and now we're seeing with the pandemic, they're actually not showing up for work um, to be able to take advantage. And it's really an opportunity for robotics to come in. And so for Wiz, we were able to tackle you know what looks like maybe an industry that you wouldn't want your advanced technology. You wouldn't think of cleaning and advanced technology, but we're really solving uh, a really inherent problem of taking some single tasks doing them consistently, providing a proof of performance and creating efficiency and allowing a whole labor force to do some transformation in terms of leveling up in terms of their capabilities, doing additional services and really providing a better and safer environment for the workforce and then for those that are inherently there. Um, and so that process is really something that's what we focus on is seeing a market opportunity, being able to develop and build a product that can scale and solve that problem globally. And then understanding how to adopt that into an ecosystem. And with those components, the opportunity is now, where else can we go by taking that same model? So if we take indoor uh, navigation to a further, where else can you go within cleaning? There are other industries that are predominantly service or labor focused where we can create some really strong value. I was just at a restaurant conference um, uh, about two to three weeks ago, and you really see some similar challenges there. So you can really see some applications and you are in terms of robotic products that help scale in restaurants. And then yeah. as we take that further, it's how do we think about that model and really expand it rapidly? Yeah. What are some examples of uh, upskilling for, let's say, the cleaning um, workforce um, once you start integrating robotics? The, the job of creating a health and safe environment for cleaning. They have 10 tasks and usually they can't get to eight of them. Um, so the first step we're able to do is let's automate the single task. So now we can take that off of the ecosystem and allow whoever's doing the work to do those other tasks within a time frame to actually provide a safer environment. That's the first step. The second is we're actually taking something that's usually laborious. So if you take vacuuming, believe it or not, that's one of the largest workers comp scenarios. So just doing the activity of actually doing the vacuuming um, is laborious and sometimes, you know, creates some long-term challenges for the workforce. And the third thing that we're doing is now you're able to actually provide a proof of performance. So now you can actually deliver a more frequent clean when you frequent, when you increase the frequency and the consistency of delivery, you actually provide statistically a safer, um, place to work. And since you've had less people that had to do the cleaning, you've actually created less, um, risk of which is relevant today of anyone coming in and creating and adding to whether it's you know a virus perspective or just a unsafe environment that is not as healthy maybe as we need it to be um, so that's immediately you're coming in and that actually creates the ability to do more effort so whether that's building you can think hospitality senior living uh, pretty much education the opportunity is we now are going to take the task and now that workforce can go do other things um, the other thing that we're finding is they actually can now up level. So instead of being a janitor, they're now a manager of a fleet of robots. So they've now gone into a technology manager um, versus a janitorial manager. And that aspect and mentality is really bringing a quality of work back. So now I'm prouder of what I'm able to do because I'm actually integrating technology into my day to day um, and it's able to be consumed. It's not technology that's too advanced. Um, for that workforce, it's something that they can understand and consume and sort of the pride of ownership and work really comes in too. Um, so for the third, I want one more fourth, actually, that's really interesting is now you can run with robotics, you actually can clean at all hours of the day. So before maybe cleaning used to be done at the unseen hours, midnight to 6am, you now can actually deliver a cleaning solution during the day because you now have this really great designed product 
doing the cleaning. So inherently the shows, whether it's the tenant or it's a guest of a hotel, they're actually seeing that the work is being done. They can identify with it. And you're really seeing there's a social aspect to, wow, this, uh, this building, this hotel, this school, this senior living facility really cares about me because they're investing in technology and I can see that they're doing the job and it is, that is beneficial to me. Yeah. Yeah. So you also bring up an interesting point where we're two years and change into the pandemic. There's been a big labor shortage. Um, and I've read about some hotels where they're actually not even opening up all of the floors of the hotel mm -hmm. because they don't have enough labor to actually go and, and clean the rooms. And they're debating on whether or not they should even clean rooms and change towels every day, you know? Um, so this obviously brings in a much stronger demand for whatever automation, whatever robotics, like whatever they can do to make this and do it at an affordable rate. How has that changed the, the sort of pressure that's put on uh, robotics companies for the type of products that they should build? I think it's a, it's a huge relief and I'm glad. Um, I think before the pandemic, we were sharing a similar story of we're not here to take jobs. We're here to actually augment work and do transformation. And that was a message that I think was just left with a little bit of a challenge just because we weren't, we didn't have that critical moment. So then with COVID, the critical moment came where not only did we need to show that we were providing a safe environment and technology is really good at showing consistency and proof of performance. Um, but coming out of the pandemic, we actually found that people weren't willing to come back. They sort of, they had an, an, an evolution and now there's a new opportunity of what type of work they could do. And I didn't want to do those tasks um, inherently and in that there were other opportunities. And so I think what it left with is the perfect place for robotics to help is those tasks that, you know, we technology can and should do so that now you can have a labor workforce that's focused on more experience. So that same hotel, we want... Um, the guest experience to increase. That's exactly what hotels are there to provide. And, you know, the goal is with the labor that they do have, show, the teams they have showing up, they are now smaller. So now you have to figure out if they're smaller, you still have to focus on guest experience. So let us take and automate the work that's sort of behind the scenes to be able to allow that smaller um, employee base to be able to provide not only the same, if not a better guest experience, which helps Obviously, the hotel be successful, book rooms, have repeat business. Um, so it's definitely, it's been, automation's always been there. I think the pandemic just helped um, sort of reveal that opportunity uh, more quickly. But I'd like to think we were always there. It's just we needed a, there was a catalyst of recognition that that, uh, that transformation's happening. And I think even more so now, um, even in the pandemic, um, we're hearing this consistently is just the workforce. It's, it's, it's even more challenging and costly just to try to get the workforce to be able to show up to the size and scale needed. Um, so now obviously people are turning to technology to be able to help them solve that problem um, and then make the workforce that is able to show up uh, expanding value and taking care of too, making sure that they have a safe and collaborative work environment. Yeah, yeah. So you have the customers and you have a clear need for um, what they want. And then you also have a company with a brand name in robotics um, that will be easily, more easily accepted by the customers. How are you taking these two and then actually acting on um, the development and getting these robots to market as soon as possible and to fit the need as much as possible? So I think the example of which first we, from a company size, we think scale first. So often, um, you know, maybe difference from a startup is our goal isn't to think, think what's the first 10 to 20, but we need to think what's the first 20,000 look like. And from that point, making sure that the unit economics and value proposition align. So a million dollar um, indoor automation robot is, could be the coolest and the greatest robot project, but it actually isn't the one that's adopted and is actually creating value because it doesn't fit within the commercials. So the way that we think about development is if we understand adoption and change management, we need to make sure what are we, what value are we providing and how are we doing that within a unit economics that matter. So if we're thinking about being within a direct labor workforce, um, making sure that we're able to be a, a value proposition that works within your team base. So if you're hiring 10 people and you want to add 11th and that 11th is your robot, making sure that the dollar cost of what that looks like doesn't look different and strange. So how do we think through adopting that product? So then we look back to how do we design? 
Um, so we think on scalable designs. So we, we focus on bomb costs. So one, it's got to look good. So design elements, bomb costs, making sure we have the right components, and then obviously making sure that it's safe, safe from a data perspective, and then obviously safe because it's working in and around people. Um, that's really critical and important. The first thing you can't have is um, you know, a robot that's going around and uh, creating a scenario that isn't safe for people um, and making sure that you have those fail safes in place. So you put those components together and when you orchestrate all that together, you actually very often can have a successful product. But I think for us, it starts thinking scale um, and customer experience and adoption first, and then almost working backwards um, to be able to orchestrate that. And I don't want to, that doesn't mean that we don't have amazing engineers, technology experts, but really starting for the result that we want first allows us to orchestrate the right product um, at the right time versus maybe just creating the best robot for the sake of a robot. It's creating the right result and experience using robotics and the available technologies that we have. Yeah, no, it's a very interesting point. The difference in how a small company thinks about developing a product versus a large company thinks about developing a product that has the capital to execute quickly. Um, and whereas, you know, from what I would imagine with a smaller company, you're going a bit more off of intuition, um, asking a smaller sample size of people, and then iterating quickly on building a couple of different small products. Um, whereas with the big company approach, you're, you're taking a much more data heavy um, approach to understanding the product needs. So what, what is this data like and what is this decision process on how you build a product well, from think, SoftBank's point of view? Yeah, sure. Well, I think it's, so I think there's, uh, there's the business research side. I think then there's like pure data side. So from a business side, we talk like we want to, it's got to be a market that has a big enough size to be able to absorb. If, if scale, it's going to require capital at some point. So it has to, the return has to justify the capital. And that's obviously with robotics and any, piece that has hardware capital early is usually one of the challenges, right? For a software company, usually you can rail and you can scale um, your capital deployment with hard with hardware. It's very early because you need all those components to be able to develop. So you have to have a big enough size of market um, to be able to be successful. So a lot of the data is done in market research, understanding the, you know, whether we want to, we say TAM, but truly is finding where is there a marketplace where there's a task or we focus on service-oriented businesses at scale that have global reach. So not just any specific region have global reach. And we do a lot of data on understanding the market uh, economics there, um, particularly where there's a high, it's a high mature market. It has a high component of a workforce that needs to be transformed or labor. Um, those are usually areas where we focus specifically because we believe uh, our capabilities of understanding how to drive collaboration within that model. Um, change management and adoption um, from a commercial side are really important. Fleet management, all the components that you need, that's really our first focus. And then when you work back, it's then how do we assess um, where is the maturity of the technology to be able to orchestrate that at some level of speed? Um, if it's going to be ready in 10 years, the market's too dynamic. So then how do we assess, um, let's call it market readiness? So that could actually be maybe a startup that has an advanced technology that could be something that we could accelerate. Um, an example with Wiz is uh, Brain OS. So they have a spectacular operating system and uh, the Vision Fund made an investment to be able to help, uh, among others, to be able to help uh, solidify and scale that opportunity. And that's something that we were able to leverage through our products. Um, Brain OS is a company that's building, um, it's, a, it's a control system for robotics that, that can work with a wide range of different robots. Mm -hmm. it's, yep. it's more of a software company, right? Yep, absolutely. Yes, they're they're re a really good software company. Done a really good job of creating an a a platform to be able to understand, yeah, how to do your operating system of allowing robots uh, to actually be mobile, be safe, and actually do it at at a safe and and sort of expandable format. Um, and I think that idea was critical. So for us, you say what data? So it's understanding technology readiness. Um, they had an amazing technology. It was also the unit economics. It was something that could be that worked within our model. They definitely had the technology stack. And then we were able to accelerate that. And really, that maturity is something we see. Take that out, and now let's apply it to other industries. Um, there are other opportunities and companies out there that have great tech stacks that we can leverage. Um, and or if there's a unit economics, we really feel like we can. we have the breadth and scope to be able to orchestrate 
the right business model to be successful, um, whether that's internal from an IP, but also orchestrate other capabilities. So we really take, we, we say it's agnostic, but we really believe our goal is the result. And that's real, like, I would say more of an accelerator. So big and small is not our thinking. Our thinking is, can we orchestrate a opportunity by leveraging technology, um, supply chain, and then commercial adoption, bring that together and then use it and then combine data and collecting that data and or providing a proof of performance that wasn't there to be able to actually streamline that. And then as you start to build these on, stack these onto each other, you actually have a pretty powerful um, network of both capabilities as well as information to help do some change management in some pretty big industries. Yeah, when you're talking about leveraging these companies for their technology and accelerating them, this is partially investing in these companies as well and then pulling them into the SoftBank fold, mm -hmm. right? Yes. Uh, yeah. Yep. So then in this way, you have a, a portfolio of companies that are all now helping each other. Um, and then they're sort of building the technology works off of each other, if I understand correctly. Yep. It will, and so it, it doesn't always have to be investing. It's more of what's the right. Each situation is unique based on the maturity of the market and the company. Sometimes um, there are opportunities of it's the venture capital investment is all that's needed. So that would be the vision fund. Sometimes there needs to be a partnership effort to be able to bring the commercial capabilities into the marketplace. So it might just be capital. Um, it could even be bringing some enterprise clients that we have into the fold and being able to bring more scalability of a client base um, into the ecosystem. So it's, it's, there's a lot of knobs. So sometimes investment, just pure venture capital. Sometimes it's partnership. Um, and then sometimes there is even a minority stake, but our principle is making sure that it's got to be something that we can adopt and bring value in the market, um, not just uh, for say research and development, it's got to have a market application for us. Yeah, yeah. And that's another one of those clear differences between how um, a startup company would be able to navigate this space versus um, a company like SoftBank. Uh, absolutely. And I'm excited. I, I think the, the best part I've seen is even now, though, there's a lot of uh, private equity and venture funding coming into robotic companies. I think we're seeing there are stacks that are repeatable and there are some really cool companies and products that you're, you're not at a point where you have to start almost at negative five. You're actually starting at, you know, if you're doing a 400 yard dash, you know, you're starting at a hundred yards. So we're really seeing these companies that are able to develop some pretty cool technologies or line of thinking that are really powerful. Um, and so that's what we're excited. And then how do we fit in as either an accelerant um, or a continued scalable model? We really don't think it's a compete for us. It's more of how do we help partner? Um, so there is venture. So I don't think we're not trying to be venture. We're more of what is your operational accelerator um, and thinking on the commercial side and then what tools do we need to be successful? Um, you know, you have to understand the commercial model. You have to understand data. You have to have an architecture to be able to absorb the data within your model and or the partners. Um, and I think that's really where we help startups is they should be focused on product market fit, making sure their technology is reliable and we can help bring sort of that commercial scalability at the right pace so that you're helping to do it. Cause that's usually a, you know, uh, a friction point for any startup is, all right, I've got my idea. I've got my product market fit. Now, how do I scale? And particularly in robotics, that's a pretty hefty lift because now you have to understand supply chain and some of your bomb cost challenges and doing all that. Um, and we we want to help. We can help, um, but we usually start with a market idea, and therefore that usually brings the ecosystem along. When you have a strong market opportunity um, and a business model that can scale, um, that brings that de-risks a lot of the model. So it helps startups have more of oxygen in a partnership um, because we you can understand there's a value there's there's, uh, I say revenue margin, there is value for all parts of the ecosystem for the end user for, you know, whether it's a distributor or a partnership for SoftBank and then for the startup. So that type of ecosystem, we're really a fan of, and we've seen it work um, a few times and we actually see it working for us in the next couple of years. Yeah. And um, so right now we're also in an environment where there's a lot of people who are fearing uh, a recession coming on and things like venture capital slowing down, especially in investments in what can be more risky um, companies like robotics that have high hardware output. Mm -hmm. What's your, what's your outlook on that? 
So, well, I think if we look at the data, I think even in the last year, I, I think we're still, we haven't seen saturation maybe in some other verticals of investment into robotic companies. So I don't think we're at a point of saturation. So I do think we're still going to see investment into the category. Um, and the reason we're going to see it is because there's such a huge gap in like the workforce. What we're seeing is things like warehouse automation, automation in general of creating efficiency is still, there's a huge need. Um, labor, we know across industries is, um, there's a huge gap in who's able to show up for work and who's not. So I think what we're seeing, no matter, even in a, in a growth or a recession market, there still is an inherent problem that is in the market. So I think it's more of everyone is looking for de-risked investments. I think as long as you have the unit economics and you're building a product that's focused on solving an inherent problem and you're not creating an, let's call it an over-engineered product. I really think there's going to be continued growth in service robotics. And I think even as we look at the next two to three years, I think in, in robotics, service, professional service, robotics, um, logistics, where else, I think are going to still have a strong growth rate. So therefore, if there's strong growth, as long as you have good unit economics, I still see capital being able to be funneled. However, I think you're going to see no matter what, everyone's going to take the, they're going to de-risk their metrics. Um, but one of the great things that I think about robotics that I found is it's actually a pretty predictable ramp. So for us, when we're building our business plans, if you understand adoption, it actually can be um, pretty predictable if you've solved product market fit and are able to have that value proposition and focus on adoption. Um, so it's easy to consume. I can understand if I'm building a automated vacuum cleaning robot, I can actually predict how many I can scale based on the market. And it's really just a matter of picking the right product and the right company versus maybe a, a newer technology that does that hasn't been absorbed or understood by venture or a specific model. We can actually get pretty predictable in our ramp. So I actually I believe and I'd love to always love the conversations about I think we're actually going to be in a insulated a little bit just based on the problems that are out there. Um, it's not to say you're going to see some venture pullback, but I think as long as you stay focused on solving problems in market um, and there's a need and there's a commercial model that can generate value, um, you're going to see investment sustained in robotics. Whereas I think five years ago, it was actually risky because there wasn't a, a model or a need. I think there's now a strong need um, focus and there's now more companies to participate in investment, whereas maybe there were just a few, there's a lot more that are in market to be able to be successful. Yeah. What are you, what are you excited about coming up in uh, the research and development at SoftBank Robotics? I, to me, uh, I think, so the, in R and D, the way we think about it, uh, it, so we think about the market sort of two big things. I think within indoor navigation, smart robotics, the more we see a collaboration of mobile technology connecting into other data solutions in and around the inside of a building is fascinating for me. So it's about providing more of a collaborative solution. So it's maybe a single task of what a robot was doing combined with other technologies that are in and around a building. I think there really are some powerful things that are happening um, in that area. And then I think from, let's call it from a industrial and outdoor perspective, whether it's warehousing or others, I think we're starting to see some really powerful capabilities in terms of you now have navigation that's become mature enough through the automotive industry. And what we're seeing is there's really the ability to drive some strong um, value where, uh, you know, a autonomous um, vehicle or robot can, out, can actually do a outperform any human element that was delivering it before and do it pretty consistently. So I think we're going to see this really large change and shift where we're now comfortable with a automated solution working in and around people and doing it safely, successfully, um, and from a scale. So as a, as a, as you can tell from a like orchestration perspective, there's a lot, all the ingredients are there to be able to be put together, to be able to scale. And I think that's what I found to drive adoption. Um, and that's what makes it exciting to be able to build an industry that can continue to be more, that grow in its mainstream. Um, capabilities versus maybe was sitting out as a niche capability. So that to me is the biggest, like let's call it development. Um, I think from research perspective, I think we're continuing to just see, I think as you know, whether it's sensor technology or cameras, or uh, I think machine learning libraries, I think it's because robotics has now been adopted. I'm really seeing some really powerful architectures 
they're now becoming a, adoptable and absorbable. And so I think that's only going to further accelerate. So I think we're just actually getting to a point where we're adoption ready versus just uh, development ready. And that's what gets me excited because we can start to bring some cool products to market and see some really meaningful and scalable value. Yeah. Yeah. No, what you mentioned is really exciting. That point where we're going to start trusting some of these automated systems a bit more than you would having a person go out there and do it the way they used to. That's a- um, so that that is exciting. And it's when a lot of these uh, technologies start to come together. And I, I think in the end market is starting to understand that they need to evolve. So I think that transformation um, is coming. So I, we talk a lot, workforce transformation is, is an area that's really critical. So a lot of these technology, a lot of the solutions we just talked about that robotics usually really help solves is evolving its the ability of the workforce to be able to work in and around these technologies, no matter where they are. So that trust factor is important. And so I think that you see an end user saying, I need to redevelop my operations to be able to now understand that there is robotics available. Whereas before I was designing my process and operation around either just people or a different set of tools. Now I have robotics as a tool set and smart robotics as a tool set to be able to think about how do I provide a better service? And I think that's what's exciting is it's now asking us the question of, okay, I acknowledge now I need to understand how robotics is going to help me. Robotics and data needs to help inform how I transform my workforce. Can you help me solve that problem? Those are really good triggers that know that it's now we're moving past early adoption stage and moving into a chasm of, okay, I need to really integrate this into, I need to trust that this is going to work. And then I now need to integrate it into all of my processes, procedures, um, procurement, which is, believe it or not, a, a, you know, a challenge as well. I need to understand that. And that's really when you can start to see scale and that gives the industry oxygen. And when we have oxygen, then we can really allow some cool things to happen. Awesome. Thank you for speaking with us today. Well, I'd say this was great. Thank you very much for taking the time uh, to speak with me.